It's the Salmon of Knowledge Podcast. It's the Salmon of Knowledge Podcast. If you've heard it before, you know what it is. But if you haven't heard it, then this is what it is. It's the Salmon of Knowledge Podcast. It's a stream of consciousness podcast. I've got some hot takes. I've got some cold takes. I've got some lukewarm takes, mostly lukewarm. I may be singing a song or two or tell you about the things that I am thinking about. And I may be tell you about some things that I'm watching. The things that have happened to me. This is my podcast. I've been doing this for a year of podcast. I used to do another podcast called Reviewables. That's absurd. That's a podcast. But I'm doing this podcast every seven of knowledge. I hope you enjoy it every seven of knowledge. If you enjoy the podcast, leave me a review. Edwin, seven of knowledge podcast. Hey, seven skins, and welcome to another episode of Edwin Salmon of Knowledge, where I improvise uh, a theme song every episode now for a minute because I don't have the ukulele. I mean, I do have the original theme song that I did record and have been using, but it's fun to kind of just throw a couple of beats in there and a couple of mouth beats, spitting into a microphone, beatboxing, whatever you want to call it. It all sounds cool as long as you do it right. And I don't know if I'm doing it right. So I hope you're all doing well. This is a little extra episode. I mean, look, it's a numbered episode. I'm basically, I'm trying to get to 100 episodes. And then I'm going to change the format of this show up a little bit. It's still going to be funny, hopefully. I mean, I hope you find it funny. It's still going to be slightly stream of consciousness, But what I'm going to do is I'm going to pick an actual topic to extrapolate upon, do a bit of research and lay some actual knowledge on you. Because for a long time, uh, my knowledge has been very basic. My knowledge has been, you know, what's the best ice cream to get? Um, And now here is a little bit of knowledge. And I'm not sponsored by Tesco, uh, Tesco being part of the Walmart family we're a family it's always disturbing when corporations call themselves families because they're not they're uh, unless the family don't know each other and all they want to do is make money and they don't speak in fact they kind of don't even know their own middle names or likes and dislikes uh, which is of course what everyone knows about their families you always know your brothers and your mother's and father's middle names. My dad's middle name is Leo. Um, my mum's middle name, I don't actually know. Does she have a middle name? Do you have a middle name? Now, I know my dad's name is actually Patrick. And my mum's name is actually Annie. Not actually Patrick and actually Annie. Just Patrick and Annie. Um, but they go by Jerry and Anne. And for years, when I was in school, because my name is Edwin, and no one had ever heard that name, and when you don't recognize the name, it's confusing and scary. And all the other kids were kind of angry and confused and scared. And they were like, we're not going to call you that. But we're not going to call you Ed, because that would be too clever, shortening it just to Ed, which is kind of what I go by now, um, if you know me. And if I'm being pretentious and uh, the lead singer of Arcade Fire, I go by Wynn. Because Wynn Butler from Arcade Fire, his real name is Edwin. But he goes by Wynn instead of Ed because of pretension. I'm guessing. So I was called Eddie. In fact, I had many nicknames that were variations on Eddie. Eddie Spaghetti. Uh, Eddie Edwina Curry Be Strong. One friend called me that. No one else called me that. Uh, Eddie Get Ready. Steady Eddie. uh, Eddie Curly Ed. No, I meant that last one up. But yeah, Eddie I was called. And uh, some people from my hometown in Burr County Offaly, I don't know if anyone in Burr County Offaly is listening to this, they still call me Eddie uh, when I go home, which is occasionally. I'm actually going home next week. 
to see my grandparents and get away from Moses, the dog, who is barking outside. Now, I've ordered batteries for his shock collar. Now, when I say shock collar, it sounds cruel and unusual punishment uh, style, but it's not. It just gives him a mild shock. Like, have you ever grabbed an electric fence? I pretended to grab an electric fence today. Myself and Cara and uh, Luke went to meet uh, Cara's cousin and uh, her husband and their child. I won't name names because I respect their privacy. And uh, we walked around uh, a place that I can't remember uh, the name of. We were there before. It's like it's got like a kind of a farm and it has pigs and goats and sheep. And it has some Jersey cows, which are the most attractive cows you'll find. And they're all there with their big hanging udders, all veiny. Um, But you get distracted uh, from that because it's kind of disgusting it kind of looks like it's going to explode like when you see uh some some angry uh, man and his vein starts throbbing in his head like that meme of that guy on the computer um i don't know who he is or where he comes from it's probably a whole backstory to that guy um but they're they're eyelashes these are like really sexy cows not sexy in the sense that you want to have sex with them but like attractive cows, like, you know, they obviously picked the most attractive cows, like the laughing cow, you know, that uh, gorgeous cow who sells you cheese. Um, she's very attractive. Just lovely eyelashes, lovely eyes, kind of, you know, you um, you don't think about the fact that they've got four stomachs and they bring up the they chew the cud, bring it up as sick, swallow it again and work it through their, their various stomachs. Um, we saw little pigs today and lately because I've been singing the Beatles to uh, Luke my son my little son Luke if you want to see Luke check out my Instagram it's Edwin Salmon my name name of the podcast Um, but I've been singing mainly Paul McCartney songs because it's a weird thing I think who your favorite Beatle is depends on your age, I think, and where you kind of are in life. Because when I was a teenager, I really was a big fan of John Lennon. But then as you get older and uh, time keeps uh, wandering on, you start to appreciate, like I was appreciating George Harrison a lot more. But now in my mid 40s, I appreciate Paul McCartney a little bit more. And I think because obviously John Lennon died it was murdered in um it makes it sound like it was a mystery that was never solved he was shot uh, and killed in new york in 1980 when he was only 40 years old which is insane to think of now because i'm um, you know i'm 4 years older than that um so he was kind of became a sort of a saint i guess in a lot of ways or as paul mccartney put it in the Disney Plus show that is on Disney Plus, once again, not sponsored by Disney Plus. Um, but it's a great show. It's him talking to Uber producer Rick Rubin, uh, just about songs and about the past. And, you know, I'm a big Beatles nut. And the Beatles have been around for 78 years at this stage. And there have been, like, documentaries. And I've watched the, you know, the anthology. I've read books on the Beatles. I've heard all the stories and there were a couple of stories that I had heard before, but there were a couple of things that I hadn't heard before. But also it was just nice to see Rick Rubin, who obviously is a music producer and loves his loves his music and is knowledgeable about music. Ask him questions about, you know, what would they listen to on the radio? How did they record things? How did it work? There's one bit where he isolates, you know, they're like they're at a mixing desk isolating uh, tracks, you know, isolating the bass lines from these Beatles songs. And when you isolate the bass, and sometimes the bass and drums, the rhythm section, and it's like two separate songs. Like, the, the he brings up the rhythm section, you know, you've got the guitars, and then he brings up the bass and drums separately. And together, it makes a song. But separately you know one sounds like a it's like what is that song 
and then you bring up the rhythm and you go, oh, okay, it's uh, something. Uh, or it's, uh, well, what's the one? And your bird can sing, which I'd never heard isolated. I'd never, like sometimes you will listen to the bass line and you go, oh, that's, that sounds pretty nice. That's really kind of, you know, like I, I, I appreciate how innovative Paul McCartney was with his, uh, his bass lines. And, uh, but you don't really hear it in isolation. You can't when you're listening to it. But he was like, just listen to the bass. And Rick Rubin, you know, he just isolated the bass line for something. And then, at the, and then he like turned it down, looked at Paul McCartney and went, that's the greatest thing I've ever heard. How did that happen? Tell me how to walk me through it. How does that happen? Um, but yeah, a great, uh, great show. Only six episodes, six half hour episodes. I wish there was more. But uh, very enjoyable if you're a Beatles fan or even just a fan of music um, in general. But I've been singing Beatles songs to Luke, mainly uh, Paul McCartney songs, Martha, My Dear, uh, Let Him In. I've been singing some of the uh, solo stuff, Live and Let Die, some of the Wings stuff. I don't know why I'm getting all north of England. But you know, you know that's you know that's uh, Paul. You know, Paul. He's you know he's got a great range of stuff, and he's very you know he writes kind of like old fashioned tunes, as seemingly so. Like Penny Lane is a good one. It's got a very uh, clean kind of sound to it, but lyrically it's kind of a bit wacky and out there. And these are things that you just you appreciate more. Like Maxwell's Silver Hammer was one from. Abbey Road, the last Beatles album that was recorded, not the last one that was released, that was Let It Be, but that's a that's a whole other story for you. Um, but Maxwell's Silver Hammer, which has always kind of made, people made fun of it because it was like, oh, it's just a sad song. It's like Paul McCartney trying to be cool writing about a serial killer or something. like that. It's the worst song about a serial killer. But like, I just love the tune of it, like, you know, and and he uses a synthesizer and one of the very early synthesizers when it was like in a room by itself, like, you know, like the old computers were like a, were big uh, and then they got small, but they were big and now they're huge uh, in popularity. Um, I'm stealing a joke there from uh, Dream Gun Fulham Reads Shawshank Redemption, uh, available wherever you get good podcasts film reads check it out i'm in a bunch of them so uh he's loving the paul mccartney he he's uh, uh, you know and it's good to sing to him it stimulates his brain um but why when we were in this this farm looking at these pigs and of course i thought of the song piggies written by george harrison from the white album or the beatles as it was called Afterwards, it was called The White Album. And uh, I started saying, Have you seen the little piggies in the starched white shirts? And Carrie gave out to me because uh, her um, cousin's kid was uh, trying to hear what the pigs were making. The oink, oink noise that they make. Except they don't make an oink, oink noise. You know, like a lot of uh, animals, would you say, what noise they make, you know, it actually makes sense. Uh, woofs and barks, but oink oink, you never hear a pig go oink 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 oink. They go, <coughs> but you can't really, you can't say, oh, they make a ha ha noise or <coughs> anyway. There's some weird ASMR for someone. And Kara said to me, Ed, will you shut up singing the Beatles? A child is trying to hear a pig snort. And that put me in my place. So anyway, that's my recommendation. Uh, watch McCartney 321 is the name of it. Six episode series on Amazon. No, sorry. <laughs> on Disney Plus. On Amazon Plus, I was going to say. Or Disney Prime. Uh, right now. And I'm going to do some readings when we come back after these commercial uh, breaks. I want to thank you for listening to the podcast. We'll take a break and people 
try and sell you things You don't have to buy them But only if they are things that you want and you need And we're back guys Thank you so much for continuing to listen to this podcast In the last episode I read a folk tale So I'm going to read another folk tale From a book I got from the library Well Cara got from the library A hundred classic stories Now here's another classic story It's called The Precious Stove. Remember that classic story? No, I don't either. But it's a classic. It's an Austrian folktale. See, I did a bit of research because in the last episode, uh, episode 79, I read a story which was an old classic folktale called The Teeny Weeny Woman, The Itsy Bitsy Lady. And it was all about a teeny weeny woman who uh, stole a bone from a graveyard. And then a ghost came to her house and demanded the bone back. And she was like, I was going to make soup from that bone. Human soup. And uh, she gave the bone back and the ghost went back to the graveyard. And it was fine and cutesy and uh, for kids because everything was itsy bitsy teeny weeny. Yellow cannibal bikini so now the precious stove and see these uh, these are stories that were you know never written down uh they were just you know handed down through generations telling them the oral tradition of storytelling which i completely respect but it turns out a lot of these are just weird and scary stories and i guess they're weird and scary. I mean, I did a little bit of research to try and find the origin of some of these, and there is no origin because they go back so so long. So it's just to kind of warn kids about, you know, don't rob bones from graveyards and make soup out of them, I guess. So anyway, here is another one of those stories uh, for kids. So let's have some appropriate music. Uh, thank you. And it's called... The Precious Stove, an Austrian folk tale. Here we go. Peter lived with his mother and father and his brothers and sisters in an old wooden cottage deep in the woods of Austria. Now, straight away, they're in trouble. Deep in the woods in Austria, nothing good ever happens there. They were very poor and the cottage had hardly any furniture and they might have been very cold in winter were it not for their most treasured possession. A stove. Simple Austrian woodland folk. This was no ordinary stove. It was made of white porcelain, and it was so tall the gold crown at the top almost scraped the ceiling. Its feet were carved like lion's feet. The talons painted gold. Talons? I don't think I don't think lions have talons. I think you're thinking of eagles there. Whoever wrote this. Uh, Claws, I guess, is what you're thinking of. Uh, If we're talking about uh, uh, lions. But look, I'll go on. The sides of the stove, the flanks, that's what I call them. The sides of the stove were painted with flowers and rare birds in glowing colours. And the door was tiled in blue and gold. It looked very out of place in the poor wooden cottage, for it had originally been made for a king's palace. So how the hell did they get it? Maybe that will come into play later. I continue. Many years before, Peter's grandfather had rescued it, after a great war, from the ruins of the palace where he used to work. Now, whose side was Grandad fighting on in this great war? Was he a good guy? In the great, was it the Austro-Hungarian War? Was it the Hundred Years War? Which war was it? What did he do? What crimes did he commit? Apart from stealing a stove. Peter used to draw copies of the flowers and birds on pieces of brown paper with a stub of old pencil. Wow, fun times for Peter. Also, Peter, typical Austrian name. One evening, as Peter and his sister Gilda, okay, that's more Austrian, lay curled up in the warmth at the foot of the stove, their father came in, shaking the snow from his boots. He looked tired and ill. 
My children, this is the last night you will be able to enjoy our beautiful stove, he said sadly. Oh, that wasn't that sad. I'll, I'll continue in a more sad, sad voice. Tomorrow it will be taken away, as I have had to sell it. We have had no money left, and we need food more than we need a grand stove, said the father, who seemed to be from France. The children were horrified, but their father would not change his mind. That night, instead of banking up the stove to keep it burning warmly through the night, he let the fire die down, so it was quite cold in the morning. you think he'd, like, give it one last go, seeing as he was selling it. You know, stupid move for the father. Maybe they didn't have any wood left. That night... I read that bit, sorry. The traders arrived the next morning and loaded the stove onto a cart, and off it rumbled down the track towards the town. Peter's mother and father looked at the handful of gold coins the traders had given them and shook their heads. It seemed a poor bargain when all was said and done. Fucking seller's remorse there. Just negotiate better at the top, you stupid parents. Peter and Gilda whispered together outside behind the woodpile. You have to follow the cart, Peter, said Gilda, so you can see where our stove goes. So, I don't know how old Gilda is. So Peter rushed off down the track after the cart, pausing only to stuff a couple of apples into his pocket. The journey into town was slow as the stove was heavy, so the cart could not travel very fast, but by evening it had reached the station. Peter crept as close as he dared, and heard the trailers arranging for the stove to go to Vienna by train the very next morning. He made up his mind very quickly. Once the traders had gone to, to an inn for the night, he clambered up and inside the stove. There was plenty of room inside for a small boy, and he knew that air would come in from the grill at the top under the golden crown. He soon fell fast asleep inside a stove. I mean... There's no more comfortable place than inside a stove. When he awoke, the train was moving fast. It sped through snowy forests and past the mighty Danube River. So you know where you are. Peter munched his apples and wondered what his parents would be thinking and just where he was going to end up. And then what could he do, anyway, to keep the stove for his family? Yeah, he's just a boy. What's he going to do? Bring it home when he's back? It seems like a fool's errand. And Peter seems like a fool. It continues. Eventually the train came to a halt, and with much banging and clattering, all the boxes around the stove were unloaded onto the platform. Then Peter heard a gruff voice. Have a care, sir. That valuable stove is going to the palace. Take care it isn't damaged in any way, or it will be the worse for you. Oh, that's a gruff Austrian. The palace. Peter's knees shook. God, he's got old knees and he's only a little boy. The palace. Why, that was where the king lived. Wow. Fucking Columbo here, huh? Sherlock Holmes figured it out. Peter sat as quiet as a mouse. And mice aren't that quiet. They squeak a lot. As he felt the stove lifted up off the train and onto another cart, it clattered through cobbled streets and over a wooden bridge and then came to a halt. Many voices came through the grill as the stove was moved off the cart. My word, the king will be pleased. Look what a fine stove it is, said one voice. It must have come from a palace originally. Look at the golden crown at the top, said another. Well, what, what an amazing uh, cacophony of Austrian voices. Then there was silence for a while. Peter strained his ears and his knees shook a little more. He's got to get those knees looked at. Then he heard the swishing of long robes on a polished floor, which is just a sound that everyone's familiar with, and a murmur of voices, then a deep hush. Truly, it is a very beautiful stove. I did not expect it to be so fine. Look at the quality of the painting around the sides, said a deep, important voice. Maybe that should have been deeper. And then the handle of the door turned, and light flooded into the stove. Peter tumbled out onto the floor as the same deep voice said, Good gracious, what have we here? There is a child in the stove. Maybe he's going to think that the stove gave birth to a small boy called Peter. 
Or maybe he's not as dumb as Peter is. Peter picked himself up and looked up into eyes that were full of laughter. Okay. It sounds like he's falling in love. They belong to a man dressed in a bright red jacket with a great gold tassels and gold buttons. Many glittering medals gleamed on his chest. A great silver sword hung by his side. It was the king! Peter was absolutely terrified, but the king kept on smiling. <laughs> like a creep. Well, my boy, would you like to tell me how you come to be inside my new stove? He said in an Austrian accent that was getting out of control. A servant rushed forward and grabbed Peter by the arm, meaning to drag him away, but the king raised his hand and let and the man stepped back. Let the child speak, said the king, who loved to hear the voices of children, apparently. Well, once Peter found his tongue, he could not stop. He told the king all about the stove, how it had stood in their poor cottage for as long as he could remember, which wasn't very long because he was a child, how much the family welcomed its heat in the winter, and he told the king that his father had been forced to sell the stove for a few gold pieces to buy food. The king listened in silence while Peter told his story. Pisa, I am not going to give you back your stove for it belongs here in the palace, but I will give your father several bags of gold, for it is a very valuable stove. And perhaps you would like to stay here and look after it for me he asked. Peter was delighted. He obviously hates his family and doesn't want to return. But, I mean, if a king with laughing eyes and many medals and a big sword asks you if you want to hang around for a bit, you're going to be like, all right, fuck my family. Uh, oh, where were we? And he looked after the stove for the king from that day on. His family never wanted for food again, and every summer they would all come to stay at the palace to see Peter, and the stove, of course, who they loved more than Peter, it seems. When the king discovered how good Peter was at drawing, he sent him to art school, and he became a very fine artist. But when he was an old man, all his grandchildren wanted to hear was the story of how he came to Vienna inside a stove. The end. So the lesson there is, even if you become a very fine artist whom the king himself has uh, deemed you to be and sent you off to, to uh, practice art, it doesn't matter because you'll always be this dumb little boy who hid inside a stove um, all those years ago. So there you go. That is uh, The Precious Stove, an Austrian folktale, which I guess is about how fucking important stoves are i suppose so guys um before we go i am going to briefly read uh from a book it's my book i have been writing a book yes i have um i've been writing a book which is a sort of a memoir slash uh comedy book slash uh, slasher no it's basically uh, a book about my life but also I don't know if some of you may know this some of you may not about seven or eight years ago I had uh, well in 2013 how many years ago that is now I don't know um, I was diagnosed with bowel and liver cancer and spoiler alert I survived but I've been writing uh, a book which you can read pretty much everything I've written so far. It's all up there on my Patreon. If you want to become uh, a Salmon Skin and become a monthly subscriber, um, there's extra episodes up there as well and other bits and pieces, little videos and stuff that I haven't released to the general population. So I was going to read uh, to finish up read a little bit of my book, which I don't have a title for. Uh, originally, because I did a stand-up show called Edwin Salmon vs. Cancer, and that is the working title of the book until it changes. So uh, I'm going to read a little bit for you now, and I hope you enjoy it. So here we go. Here's my book. 
Chapter 1 It is the morning of the 20th of May, 1977. I am being born in Banaslow Hospital in Galway, and my mother is only slightly disappointed that I am not a girl. I have an older brother, and the perceived wisdom around children at the time was that the order goes, boy, girl, boy, girl. It's not a major disappointment for my mother. Sure, she doesn't get to call me Leah or buy any nice girl's clothes for me, but at least there is a wardrobe of hand-me-downs all ready to go from the first child, my big brother Julian. My father, being naturally frugal, is pleased with this aspect of the birth. They would go on to have another boy, making me the middle boy in a trio of boys. I suppose I am the typical middle child, sort of ignored and quiet. All the major milestones have already been achieved by my older brother before me, so there is not really much to surprise my parents with, unless I am born with a tail or some form of telekinesis. My whole life in front is in front of me like a wheelbarrow, as the fella says. Being the middle child is like, in some ways, being the sequel to a much higher grossing original movie. More of the same, just slightly different. If I was born a girl, it would have been a radical new direction for the story to take, with the possibility of unexpected twists and turns along the way. As it stood, there I was, crying, confused as to why I had been taken from that lovely warm and safe place where food was pumped through a cord into my belly, into the uncertain real world, where there wasn't a womb around me, shielding me from flies and projectiles of various types and sizes. So there I was, thrust into the real world, covered in goop and immediately full of wants and needs. And yet, despite being a needy, crying thing, I was instantly likeable. Just a typical protagonist. Not a notion of the difficulties that lay in store ahead of me in Act 2. But then, for a long time, nothing happened. Well, not nothing of note. It takes quite some time for a human animal to mature, Antelope and others of a similar hoofed ilk can be up and running around within hours of being born. I kept to the human party line and only made gradual inroads to full upright mobility close to a year after first arriving. Like everyone else, I was hindered by the fact that my brain was still growing in tandem with my feet. My infant body was fairly robust and in full working order. There was a period of time when my parents had a suspicion that I might be deaf which was a common enough occurrence back in the late 70s and early 80s. I just didn't seem to make a fuss about the things around me. This worried my parents as they felt I should be making a fuss about things. Making a fuss about things was something that was very important to them, and should be to me. So they took me to a doctor, who used the very scientific approach of making random noises and clapping his hands loudly behind my head. I didn't react. I just stared straight ahead in blissful ignorance at my parents' faces. The doctor said it was inconclusive at this juncture, and they would just have to keep an eye on me. As it turns out, I wasn't deaf, either then or now. Admittedly, it was so long ago that I can't remember or say with certainty what the problem was, but given the situation, I can only conclude that I could absolutely hear him, but I just wasn't interested in whatever he was up to behind my back. That was his business. I was just minding my own. This was my position for most of my youth. I just tried to keep myself to myself for most of the time. The main reason for this was because I was, in a general way, just plain terrified. Terrified of myself and the world around me, a world that I hadn't got to grips with yet. I honestly didn't know if I would ever get to grips with it. Life was a greased pig squealing at me to grab it, but my absolute everything screamed back that my hands weren't quick enough and I would need some form of grit on them, or at the very least a pair of heavy gloves, in order to form any kind of decent hold on the animal, but I hadn't the first idea where I could get said gloves or even how to form interesting analogies. So I kept quiet. Out of fear, really. A perfectly rational fear of being seen. Because if I was seen, I might have to answer questions, and I was never going to be sure if the answers were correct. I was trying to navigate the unfamiliar world in the only way I knew, but unbeknownst to myself, I was missing a vital part of development by doing this. By not asking questions, I wasn't learning anything. Because if you're not asking questions, you're just making assumptions. Assuming things leads to confusion. Like the assumption of the Virgin Mary into heaven... That was always something that confused me greatly. 
a major event in the narrative of the Bible story where the mother of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ went up into the heavens is an assumption? Like maybe she just left town? Why assume she went to heaven? I guess it saves money on hiring a private detective to track her down. Oh wait, I'm just after realising it was an ascension. See, knowledge is power and context is everything. Chapter 2 We must now jump forward in time, as, to my eternal shame, I achieved nothing in the first eight to ten years of my life. No child prodigy in this story, unfortunately. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart was playing the harpsichord at age four and writing music at age five, but I hadn't written a single joke by that time, not even the beginnings of a comedy album. I had probably laughed at my fair share of mutual flatulent exchanges between my peers, but who hadn't around that time of their lives? That didn't set me apart. Nothing really sets you apart at that age. In fact, being set apart was something that I didn't want. Like most people growing up, you want to conform. You need to conform because there is comfort in that. You blend in with the herd as best you can. No one wants to be the sheep wearing a hat. It would raise too many questions. Why are you wearing that hat? Where exactly did you get that hat? How did you, a sheep, pay for that hat? And so on. Having to explain yourself would only result in a nightmarish situation fraught with the danger of providing further explanation. Nowadays, individual expression is commonplace and, for the most part, celebrated. A sheep wearing a hat would barely raise an eyebrow. Everyone would simply look at the sheep and think, I guess he likes wearing hats. And that would be the end of it. And now I face the first bastion of mass conformity. The schoolhouse. A place where everyone would be dressed the same in identical jumpers and pants, usually grey or blue, nothing too stimulating, with pre-knotted ties with elastic bands in order to give you precious extra seconds when getting ready in the morning. These were the kind of clothes that were too big for you on purpose, so you would grow into them, and made from a space-age material that could survive a nuclear winter. It was always a gamble that a parent made when they bought you a school uniform that was extra roomy, A child would be sized up at the beginning of term, like a dog at Crufts, and a decision would be made to put them in a slightly larger uniform. Some kids would sprout up quickly like weeds, and spend a long school year in ill-fitting clothes that invaded the crotch in ways that should have been reserved for secondary school. Other kids would remain the same size, and end up looking more like a child wearing their father's clothes, which only served to accentuate their childishnessnessness. The reality of public schooling has always been something I could never get my head around. Having only been around my parents and my brothers for the majority of my young life, suddenly being thrown into the education system was quite the shock to the system. My nervous system, I mean, not the school system. I was never going to be the cool, confident kid that comes in and really shakes things up. Before school comes along, you are just another child. You are footloose and fancy-free, like Kevin Bacon in the film Footloose. You don't have to think about a structure for your day. There is no agenda. The discovery of an anthill can pretty much fill the whole day without you looking at your wristwatch, which you are not wearing because you don't have one, because you're a child. Time is almost endless in those early years. You are just living out your days. You are told when to go to bed, but you don't know when you're getting up in the morning or what's going to happen when you do wake up. But once you have a specific time to be up in order to be at a specific place, then that becomes your routine the thing that your life now revolves around. It's like having a job, except you never had an interview and nobody's paying you any money. Going to school and navigating the social norms became a daily occurrence that would fill me with anxiety. One of the highlights of my day was lunchtime. This was a highlight for two reasons. It meant that half of the school day was behind me. It also meant that I would be able to visit the nearby sweet shop and go on a mad spending spree with my 20 pence piece. And this was a time when that amount of money could actually get you a lot. It was a time of milky moos and flying saucers, not the extraterrestrial kind, the sugary kind that was made from the same stuff that edible paper was made from. It was also a time of edible paper. Now, for the most part, my mind would usually be made up beforehand as to what I would purchase in the shop in order to fill up my fuel reserves with sugar and slowly degrade my initial set of baby teeth that would eventually fall out and be sold to a fairy under cover of night by my parents, with me, asleep, acting as an unconscious broker. We only had a limited time for lunch, which in those days was called lunch time, so I had therefore eliminated any need for browsing. 
That was for the weak-minded child who had their mind on less important things like how a V-shaped valley was formed. I didn't know that then and I barely know it now. My mind as a child was full of sugar and nonsense. Now mainly nonsense. My young sugary nonsense brain had sampled most confections and had reached conclusions on all. I could have probably written a thesis on it. I had no doubts as to what I was going to purchase. Yet sometimes there were dissenting voices. If there was another child standing outside the shop, they would inevitably question your pre-made decisions and throw the whole operation into chaos. And if it was someone from your class who was technically a peer but not actually a friend, it could become a long, drawn-out affair regarding the merits of each chosen confection. If I walked towards the building of Sugary Delights and Francis Doran was there, not his real name, he would begin an unwanted dialogue and the ensuing exchange would waste valuable minutes of my free, sweet-eating time. But not going past would result in no sweets at all, so I had no choice but to run the gauntlet and straight away Francis began his line of inquiry like an idiot detective. What are you getting, Fishy Salmon? This was very annoying. My older brother had been christened with the moniker Fishy and now it was beginning to be applied to me, which I didn't like. It was an unfortunate consequence of a lack of imagination, leading to the most appropriate and degrading nickname a classroom of young boys could think of. They had peaked with Fishy, and had nothing else to offer when the second born came along. Don't call me Fishy Salmon, I countered, knowing it would have no effect on Francis. But that's your name because you're a fish, countered Dorn with flawless logic. I'm not a fish, I'm walking around. You're probably headed to the river. No, I'm not. I can't swim. I drown. Shut up, Fishy. Fishy was my brother's nickname. You can't give me the same nickname. That's not how nicknames work. This gave Francis Dorn pause. He put his hand to his head and rubbed it, as if he was trying to make his brain come to life. Then, finally, he spoke. Fish, he said, with a small amount of pride, which only served to annoy me even more. You're a fish. I said on a pointless counter-argument. No, I'm not, said Dorn, suddenly beginning to gain the upper hand in this battle of wills between two idiot children. I'm snoring Dorn after I fell asleep, and Mr. Rafter hit me on the back of the head and said, Wake up, snoring Dorn, and everyone laughed. Just let me spend my twenty pence and shut up, I pleaded with him. What are you getting? Dorn's eyes bulged along with his little pot belly. I'm getting some strawberry shoelaces and a dolphin. I said with the determination of a boy who had his mind made up. Dorn shook his head softly. No. Yes, that's what I'm getting. You should get edible paper and chocolate cigarettes. I couldn't believe these suggestions. Edible paper tastes as good as it sounds, and chocolate cigarettes were made of that terrible chalky chocolate you would find in pound shop advent calendars. There was no way I was going to subject my young taste buds to such depravity. No, Dorn, I'm not getting them. Why not? I don't like them. But you can pretend you're reading the paper while smoking a cigarette. That that was his sales pitch? To live out every nine-year-old's fantasy of being a 50-year-old man? Why would I do that? I asked him with the unfortunate knowledge that he would give me an answer. Because you can. This was not a good enough reason for me to spend my father's hard-earned 20 pence. I wasn't willing to waste that money on something like chocolate cigarettes in order to pretend to be a smoker. I would do that with a regular pen or pencil while walking to school during the cold winter months like every other child, sucking on the end of my inky pen and blowing cold air out like some cool boy. That would cost me nothing. Look, I'm not getting edible paper because it tastes terrible, I said, trying to appeal to Doran's sense of reason. But you can write on it and then eat it. Look, Doran, you can do that if you like with your edible paper. I'm not getting any. I didn't get any. I got strawberry shoelaces. Then why are you asking me to get paper? So we can write on it and eat it. That's what real paper's for. Oh, you eat paper? Just eat your shoelaces, Dorn. So uh, that is the end of uh, the second chapter. Um, And that is the first draft of my book. There's more chapters. There's like, I don't know, 18 chapters. Most of them, I think like 15 or so, are available on my Patreon. But uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I will be back soon. This is the end of this episode. Thank you for listening. I know I go off on tangents a lot. I did mention at the beginning that this podcast does not have a lot of knowledge. 
and I mentioned uh, Tesco. I said I'm not sponsored by Tesco and ice cream. And I never completed that thought. But what it is, is if you like uh, strawberry Cornettos like I do, or even plain Cornettos because they're in the deal as well, you can get two boxes of six Cornettos each for a fiver in Tesco. So that's 12 ice creams for five euro, which is a great deal. Now, the ice creams are not as big. They're slightly smaller than what you'd get. But still, it's value for money. It's great value for money. There's a bit of knowledge for you guys. Uh, I will be back with another episode uh, very soon. Thank you for listening to this episode. If you can give me a review, that would be wonderful. If you can't, that's fine. Thank you for listening. Have a good day. And I'll be in your ears very, very soon. Bye, bye, bye. See you later. Thank you.